So why would you use classification? Where would you use classification? Well, traditionally, it's been used for things like document classification, um, spam filters, right? Um, so documents, right? Like you want to know, is this document on topic X or topic Y, right? Spam filters, is this email a piece of spam or not? Things like that. But in marketing, uh, in particular, in a lot of business contexts, it has a lot of applications, right? So you might want to know if a customer is price sensitive or price insensitive, right? You might want to know if they're early adopters or late adopters. You might want to know if they're credit worthy or their risk of defaulting on a loan, right? Anytime you need that kind of targeting or customized strategy for um, your business problem, that's a great example of where you might want to use classification. And there's a bunch of common classification methods out there from K nearest neighbors to naive bays to logistic regression and support vector machines. And I'll discuss many of those in turn when we get to those sections in the course. So what does a supervised machine learning classifier actually look like? So before we get into details, I want to talk a little bit about how to measure whether or not you have a good model, right? And to understand the efficacy of a classifier, we want to use a number of different ways of looking at that model. And almost all, one way, the simple way to think of it is almost all machine learning models are essentially composed of some set of rules of the form, if attribute X has value I, then target attribute Y has value J, right? Um, for instance, if the last call with the customer, X equals duration, lasted more than 10 minutes, X greater than or equal to 600, they will respond positively to the telemarketing Y offer, Y equals yes, right? Um, and so that's kind of a lot of our composed of these rules. And if you think of machine learning in that way, it will help you to better understand some of the mechanisms that we can use to calculate how good we are at um, solving the problem that we're trying to solve. So imagine some example data like this, where you have some income and some duration, right? And so each of these customers are an instance, right? Each of these columns, except for the last one, right, are features of the um, of the of the instances, right? These are the values of those instances, right? And this response to offer, that's the um, the target class or um, the dependent variable that you're trying to predict, right? Of what's going on. So here we have three instances where we know the response to offer, and we have one that we don't. So can we figure out a way? to predict this one from the other examples. Right? So one way we might judge whether or not a particular machine learning model is successful is by accuracy. And that's by simply saying of all the examples of the testing data set, what fraction did the model classify correctly? And this is the same as one minus the error rate, right? So essentially we, we need to define the notion of a true positive and a true negative and a false positive and a false negative. A true positive means that your model predicted a positive event, like yes, right? The person will respond to the to the to the attribute, and in fact, the 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 person actually did respond to the telemarketing offer, right? A true negative means the model predicted that they won't respond, and in fact, they did not respond, right? A false positive means that your system predicted that they would respond, but they didn't. And a false negative means your system predicted that they would not respond, but they did. So if that's the case, then accuracy is the number of true positives plus true negatives divided by the number of all the instances there are, right? True positives plus true negatives plus false, false, false negatives, right? In other words, what percentage of the instances that you did not know the answer to did you prove correctly? But the problem with accuracy as a measure of success is what happens if there are only 10 positive examples in a thousand instances, right? Well, you don't have a lot to go on, right? In terms of predicting positive results, right? But more importantly, any model that just predicted all instances are negative is going to have a very high accuracy rate. In fact, it's gonna have an accuracy rate of 99.9%, .9%, no matter what, because there just aren't those many positive instances. So if that's the case, then we often use, so because that's usually the case, we often use additional ways of measuring the performance of a model. One is we calculate the true positive rate and the true negative rate separately, right? And the true positive rate means of all the examples that are positive, what fraction did the model classify correctly? 
This is sometimes also called recall or sensitivity, right? Uh, it's called recall a lot of times in information retrieval. It's called sensitivity in uh, medical systems a lot. And it's the inverse of the false negative rate, right? So take the number of true positives, divide by the number of true positives plus false negatives, and that gives you the true positive rate. The true negative rate is of all the examples that are negative, what fraction did the model classify correctly? And this is also known as specificity in um, the health literature, right? And it's the inverse of the false positive rate. So it's the number of true negatives divided by the number of true negatives plus the number of false positives, right? Precision is another term that comes down to us from the information recall literature. And it says of all the cases that the model said were positive, which fraction did the model label correctly, right? And that's the number of true positives divided by the number of true positives plus the number of false positives, right? And precision and recall, because they're taking it from two different angles, right? One way to think of precision, right, is that if I tell you that these are the positives, how many am I gonna be right on, right? And recall is, of all the positives that are out there, how many do I identify correctly, right? So it's often common to try and combine them and the F measure, which is the harmonic mean of precision and recall, is a useful way to kind of sum them up into one number and allows you to kind of more accurately compare across models. So support, confidence, and lift are a set of rules that are a set of measures that work very well for helping to understand how well a rule is represented in the data and how well it would support um, classification via that rule, right? So the support for a rule also called the co-occurrence, is how frequently both the antecedent of the rule, which is the part uh, that deals with the independent variables, matters, and the consequent, which is the part that deals with how much the dependent variables and the dependent variables, occur in the same instance divided by the total number of instance. So imagine a rule that says if x is greater than or equal to 600, then y equals yes, right? So we can evaluate the support by saying what's the probability that that exists in our training data. And so if we go back to our example data, right, these first three are training data, right? And we can see that exactly one time does that instance occur, right, out of three instances, right? So support for that rule is one third, right? The confidence for a rule is the number of times antecedent and consequent occur in the same instance divided by the number of instances where the antecedent occurs, right? Uh, so the denominator in this case is the occurrence of that particular um, um, set of inst value instances, right? Um, so if you go back to our data again, right, the probability of x greater than or equal to 600 and um, the response offer being y is one third, as we previously discussed. Now, how many times does the probability of x greater than 600 actually occur? Well, also one third. So one third divided by one third means that the confidence is one, right? That's the most times it could possibly occur, right? Um, so support is kind of a way of saying how frequently do these rules exist, right? How much support is there in the current data for it? Whereas confidence was says of all those sets of value instances that match the, the values that we talked about, right? Sorry, the set of all those instances that match the values that we talked about. How many times do we actually see the class label that we're predicting we'd see, right? And in this case, it's 100%. Now that brings us to a very important measure, which is the lift, right? And the lift of a rule is the number of times the antecedent and consequent occur in the same instance divided by the number of instances where the antecedent occurs times the number of instances where the consequence occurs, right? Um, the lift really helps to understand how much value this particular targeting rule is gonna give you over just randomly targeting those instances, right? So if X is greater than or equal to 600 and Y equals yes, right? The probability as we discussed that is RA one third. The probability of X being greater than 600, right? Is one over three. And the probability of the response being Y is also one over three. So if you were to randomly assign labels, yes or no to any of these, right? You'd have about a one third chance of getting it right, right? Because there's only one case where it is. However, if you were to use this rule, you're gonna get it right three times more likely, right? And that's what this calculation tells you. One third divided by one third times one third, so this is one ninth on the denominator. Um, so one third divided by one ninth becomes the same as one third times nine, which is three, right?
a final measure that we often talk about when discussing how well a um, particular tool works or how many well a model does is talking about models that do not necessarily provide a distinct class, but rather a probability class membership. So instead, let's say, rather than the output of my model is not yes, no, as it is in this example data, but it's instead hey, a 50% chance they're going to respond to the offer or a 75% chance, right? Well, then you can imagine building a classifier which simply stated a threshold and said, okay, anytime the system says that there's more than a 60% chance, I'm going to get a label yes, right? Uh, then we could just vary that threshold up and down until we found the best possible fit to the data that we saw, right? And receiver operator characteristic curves are a way of visualizing that. Um, so you can use an ROC curve to analyze the effectiveness of a model. An ROC curve is obtained by varying that threshold for f class membership from zero to one and then plotting the true positive rate versus the false positive rate. So ideally, if you have the best possible classifier, you'd have a line that basically went straight up and straight over, right? Because that would mean that it was able to achieve high levels of true positive values for low levels of false positive. But in reality, we almost always have some sort of curve, right? So this is a model, this is an example of comparing three different models that we built for, in this case, it was actually, we were predicting whether or not some, whether, uh, what was the peak time to tweet to maximize the number of retweets you would get, right? And we use the seasonality, autoregressive, and aggregation of individuals methods, right? And you can kind of compare and contrast how the different models do at different points. So depending upon where you set the threshold, right, this aggregation of individuals method is going to work very well. But eventually, right, it's going to be the seasonality method that works better than either of the other two, right? So it depends upon, one way to think about this is how many false positives are you willing to suffer versus the true positives that you're able to identify, right? Um, so that's a final tool. And so one thing you could do if you want to sum this up in one number is you can calculate what's called the area under the curve, which is just the total amount of area under the curve at any particular time. Now that's a brief whirlwind tour of all the different measures of machine learning that are out there, right? Or, or not all of them, but a, a snippet of some of them, I should say. It's a whirlwind tour of a snippet of some of them. There are plenty more out there. And a lot of them are even dependent upon the particular technique. And I just kind of wanted to lay out all the different techniques, um, not all of them, but many of them again, right? Um, so we already talked about the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning, right? So you kind of know a little bit about that. Um, there's also an area that's kind of almost in the middle called reinforcement learning that we haven't discussed and won't discuss in too much in this particular course, just too short. Um, but it is, does have some useful applications in business. Reinforcement learning, the basic idea is that unlike supervised learning where you get a label right away, so I said this is a positive instance or a negative instance, and unlike unsupervised learning where I never give you a label, in reinforcement learning, you take a bunch of actions, and every now and then I give you a reward of some sort, right? And sometimes it's a big reward, and sometimes it's a poor reward. And you have to then back out from the actions you took what drove that reward, right? Um, and so if you think about this, a classic example of this in marketing is trying to determine what ads are doing the best for me, right? So I, you know, we put up a bunch of pay-per-click ads on Google search, right? And only very rarely do we actually see a click, right? And what ad actually drove that click, right? Was it the ad that they're actually seeing, right? Or was it maybe that they saw three other ads that led up to that ad, right? What aspect of those ads was actually driving that clicking behavior, right? Or maybe it's a group of heterogeneous consumers, right? And some ads, are liked by some consumers and some are liked by others. And I kind of have to play around and show you a bunch of different ads to try and get you to identify one you like, right? So how do I decide to allocate those ads appropriately uh, in order to get the click that I want to get, right? Um, and one of the solutions to that is something called a multi-arm bandit, where you essentially envision all these different trials as different levels of a slot machine, and you're trying to figure out how to allocate those trials appropriately. Um, but there's also value functions, TD methods, and a bunch of other techniques out there. Um, in supervised learning, we're going to cover most of these techniques here, but there's other ones like Markov random fields and causal state modeling that we're not going to get into in this class. 
And in unsupervised learning, um, well, we won't talk too much about that in this class, but there are techniques like k-means, clustering, and community detection, and principal component analysis, singular value decomposition. So with that being stated, I just wanted to kind of wrap up our brief introduction to machine learning. And in the next uh, video, I'm going to start talking a little bit about RStudio so you have a brief introduction to that.